Good morning. Welcome to People's Baptist Church Outreach Mission Bible Study, Adult Bible Study. We'll say that for surely today. And uh, we thank God anyone who will tune into this. I'm giving it my best, trusting our Lord that it's good to lift up his name in our world every day or every time we have an opportunity. So here in the middle of everything else that any of us are involved in, we're pausing and taking the time if Jesus were to walk through our neighborhood and invite us to a seminar of his truth. Wouldn't we want to put something else aside? I surely would. I still do. I've read these scriptures before, but it's a joy to open them up. And again, anyone who will see this, thanks be to God. So again, uh, running out of room here, but I'm using... Another Bible to make sure we understand. Jesus came into our world full of the knowledge of his Father and the ability to share it among those whom God would raise up to hear it. He is the teacher. He is the absolute master rabbi of everything we could want to know about our creator God. And so all I or we, anyone else can do is learn from him and pass it on. Adding our own personal experiences by trying to walk in these truths. And that's what helps confirm it to other people wondering if this is true. Or if this works. Or if it is what it says it is. So our ability to live it out to some degree and then as God would, sometimes doors are open to share our experience, and I am treading carefully, trusting God's grace. If I have something to say of any worth, it's the Spirit of God that will confirm it to someone that it is indeed His truth. So I'd rather always happily just read the scriptures of our dear Lord who gave His life to come here and share these things in a present context so we could see them work and take faith that they still apply to our world, our place, our time. Well, the only the people that use them can say so with any affirmation. So if you're still with me, we're going to pray because we love these things. And this is the Gospel of Matthew. And my goodness, if we can't take time for this, what else can we get into? God sent his son to live out and experience among people just like us in the middle of their world it's not that he came unexpected but he certainly called uh, people to follow him as the new priority of their life if he hadn't been before or if god hadn't taken center stage in their life so it was a matter of rearranging their life to allow this to have place and we're in the 12th a uh, chapter of this Gospel of Matthew, which is 28 chapters long. We haven't even yet reached halfway. And yet now it becomes, to me, who have to share these things, certainly apparent that this is not a child's story only. Although a lot of these things belong to even the youngest among us. The beautiful truths that Jesus himself, as a born son, would learn and experience in his precious life, as an example to us all, we can take from it. We don't know too much about his early life, but we certainly trust the God of all creation. Put him in a family, and he raised him up in his own nation, and he had access to these truths. Let's pray. After which we will recite the Lord's Prayer, and not just recite it, we will pray it together, anyone. Our good and gracious God, I come before you, Lord. You are present in your world because you said so. You are the King and God of all your creation. You said so. I'm learning as I go, and I agree. It makes so much more sense to my heart and everything that goes on within it, my mind and everything I can exercise it toward, my own spirit and my desire to know things and have some kind of understanding strong enough to base a life on and move forward and live, Lord, and recognizing and coming to learn that I am given a soul, 
a part of me that is eternal from you directly, that you have possession of. And I grant and desire, now that I'm knowing what I know, to allow that, to cooperate with that plan, that you be Lord of my eternity. And so I can begin to make a place for myself in your eternity by allowing my soul to be fed and grow and, and be nourished by the things that speak to the forever. And somehow be planted in this plan, Lord God, that you have working in your world so that you will ultimately be glorified in a way that we will be no more pondering or being kind of convinced or maybe hoping we could get more affirmation or, or in some kind of middle area, we will be convinced by your very presence how real you truly are to us. We now believe by faith. Lord, there is much that Matthew's Gospel shares with us. Please allow us a m time so that we can open up our ear to hear what you truly have intended these scriptures to mean for us in our day. We know we only have uh, a limited time here, but these are to help us open up to the reality that we can take these scriptures ourselves or with our closest allies and delve into them and ask the same Spirit of God to help us understand what you, O oh Lord, meant when you sent Jesus to live out and explain and teach from so many things that happened in his ministry that we have recorded. Please, please, bless our heart, mind, soul, and strength in your word today, in Jesus' name, because of him who is the Christ. Amen. So we pray together, because he taught us so. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We can glorify our God in song. Not quite up to it at the moment. Not prepared. We've been a little busy. Um, we glorify God in our testimony. Our very life. When God uses us, we come, become committed to his, his way. Christianity, we will be baptized. We will follow in a way that God will be glorified by our very life if we let him have his way. He most certainly desires this, to show himself openly in our world by being with churches and in individuals in it. His life is still being lived. Chapter 12 of Matthew, we read at least half of it last week. I want to start where we left off. Just See how far we can get. These things will get pretty intense. Some things in Matthew chapter 12 we will look at and begin, but as God would have it, a lot of the questions that some of these things may stir up within us are addressed as we continue to follow Matthew's gospel. Jesus came not only to solve our problems, but to open to us. The desire to want to know God in a deeper way than he had been experienced by most people ever before, or maybe every person. <clears throat> Certainly the prophets had a taste, had an experience with what walking with the Spirit of God was like. And they were so moved they recorded it. And those that were true prophets, God confirmed their record and has kept it to this day for us. And the things most 
worthy that they were involved in, in expressing from God had to do with this Christ, the Son of God, this King that would come to reign over all God has created. For he's given us many opportunities to reign over it. And in some ways, it amazes me how wonderful and how far we come. And with that, history becomes a lot of uh, uh, comes a lot of record of things that we haven't done so well, trying to rule over each other. And many times, people learn from those experiences, and that's wonderful. We want to continue to learn from our experiences, both bad and good, so we can grow as people. I desire, especially God's church, continues to grow in knowledge and in truth and in a vital connection to the world he's put us in. So let's look. So I'll start where I believe I left off. Uh, verse 30 in chapter 12, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. This is such a heavy conversation. I actually should backtrack just a little bit. In verse 28, can I read from there? Verse 28 sets a real stage. Verse 27 uh, has to do with them uh, trying to accuse Jesus that he works the miracles, especially this idea of casting out devils. They brought un unto him a man who was dumb and blind, and he healed him, but he cast out this devil. His afflictions were not just physical. There was something spiritual going on, and then he was well. They didn't know how to explain it to themselves. They hadn't seen such things, it seems. They certainly were aware of spiritual states, it seems. They were aware of devils, it seems, for they certainly said Jesus is doing this by the power of darkness, this Beelzebub, Beelzebub. And uh, that offended uh, the truth in the moment. So Jesus addresses it wonderfully with grace and promise and with it warning. Verse 27, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they are be, shall be your judges. Verse 28 is what I'm getting to. This idea that Jesus is opening to us to become aware that there's a spiritual battle going on. Devils. Beelzebub. Power of darkness. And yet now Jesus exposes what he's all about. Verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, not by his own strength, not by his person itself, but because he was God's son connected to him in his very bosom wherever he went. The kingdom of heaven moved with Jesus. He was here by the spirit of God. He worked, spoke, taught, walked, lived to be a representative of what it is to be someone completely filled with God's spirit. Working every day the things that are pleasing in his sight. Feeding from and sharing the power that God can send from his kingdom. We pray the prayer, thy kingdom come, and at the end of it we're saying, Lord, yours is the kingdom. And the power, everything we ask God to do to deliver us from evil, forgive us our sins, lead us in a way that's not going to be tempting and, and overwhelm us and overtake us. All those things we ask God to do, and how does he do it? He does it by his presence among us. His very spirit of God is the power of God to let his will be done. So Jesus said, if I by the spirit of God cast out devils, then it must be he's reasoning with us to help us see. Then that must mean that the kingdom of God that John the Baptist and Jesus himself were preaching is at hand, must truly be at hand because this kingdom of heaven was working the works that only heaven could work. It was not a dark thing. It was deliverance for these precious souls from what Satan was working right in the nation of God's people. A spiritual battle. And Jesus was winning. And he was exposing to them how it is that he's winning. Because it wasn't he himself. He was representing the very presence of God in their midst better than any of them could do with greater understanding than they could ever have before. Verse 31, so uh, so to read, I'm sorry, verse 29, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house? Lord, help us with this, please. 
He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. That's where we took it, and uh, we, we only went so far. I'm going to read verse 31 to the end of the chapter, because certainly it's the Lord's words and the context are given to us in. That is the most important thing we will hear today. The most important meal we will feed upon throughout this day is these precious sayings of God. Unless he has a more particular one for each of our lives. But the lesson of this day, Matthew chapter 12, please listen as the scripture is read. Wherefore I say unto you, Jesus is speaking, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it <clears throat> shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good, and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt, and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Thank you, Lord. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he's walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. When he saith, I will, then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. <clears throat> when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. And while he yet talked to the people behold his mother and his brethren stood outside desiring to speak with him then one said unto him behold thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to speak with thee and he answered and said unto him behold I'm sorry and he answered and said unto him that told him who is my mother and who are my brethren and he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren. For whosoever will do the will of my Father, 
in heaven, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister and mother. Amen. This is chapter 12, and the Lord will help us. In the generation that I am living in, these truths are still important to me. And I still seek understanding from our Lord to help me. But I, and I, when, when I was not a Christian, and for 23 years of my life, I didn't even know what a Christian really understood what it was. But at 23, I came to the knowledge that I was not a Christian, and that I could be, and I was being invited to be, and I was actually being called, and even warned at that point in my life, that the things of God are to be taken seriously. And, uh, and I would claim that before that I was an atheist. I didn't really care about any titles, but I knew that I gave no acknowledgement to anything beyond myself. I believed we were here by accident, everything was here by accident, and we just carried on. In the pursuit of happiness was my drive. And uh, a lot of availabilities and happinesses available are not necessarily God's will and I needed some kind of guidance some kind of record of what's acceptable and what is not for I could not contain my own life as it was falling apart from my own behaviors and that's okay sometimes when people are experimenting and trying things but at some point the behaviors the little disobediences the little turning aside become the more important thing of the day, of the week. Pretty soon it becomes habit. Jesus exposed this beautiful experience uh, from a heaven point of view by saying, hmm, he that serves sin becomes the servant of sin. And he that commits sin becomes the servant of sin. Pretty soon it's our boss. Our favorite habit becomes, has dominion over us. Eventually we some people have sold out to it becomes their whole I, I want to look at something we hope we can do this Jesus is trying to save his nation he's after the heart of his nation which is the religious exercise in the temple and the worship service and the servants of it and to help them first get centered in God's will and that would save the nation but John the Baptist came offering a new opportunity to experience God to everyone equally. And those people that you might expect, one might have hoped, maybe God certainly hoped, that they would be the first ones to come down and get into this new thing God was promising. But it doesn't seem so. The common people, we might call them, the people that actually were out of God's will. Jesus summed them up one day by saying the, the harlots and the publicans, which were kind of the public servants, you know, despised caught in behaviors because they had the access to people's funds and tax monies and such. And uh, it was, there was a record that many of them behaved abusively. So they were looked down upon, but when, when they'd come to John's baptism, they would hear that God still cared about their eternal state their, and loved their soul and would allow an opportunity for them to get right and to start fresh. That's what the baptism of repentance was. To not only give people a chance to say, we're sorry, God, but to commit to him some kind of, <clears throat> uh, I won't say vow, but to realize before God that the calling now was to do it better. To get up from this baptism and proceed into a new behavior, a new way of life. To let, And that was God's will, so it wasn't as if we were now going to try to be more religious or more self-righteous. It wasn't that at all. It was... They now were connected by faith to the God of their fathers. And now they could walk by faith in the experience of their fathers. When they had known God and were pleased to do his will, when his commandments were not grievous, they were the saving grace by which they were separated from the world around them and all their failures, <clears throat> excuse me, and the diseases and all the disasters that accompanied all their ill behaviors, God said, I'm going to be among you and you're going to be a shining people because you will not experience all the devastation going on around you. 
as they serve the things that are not pleasing to heaven. <clears throat> well, that's a roundabout. But that's what God was doing. So he sent Jesus right to the heart of the nation. But he's going to eventually come up to Jerusalem with all these truths. But he suspects uh, that they won't be so received as were received by the common people on the way that had gathered themselves to him for one need or another, for one prayer, desire or another. He had ministered life to them, grace and truth and abundance. <clears throat> And now that they're challenging the, the religious order that is fearing what's about to happen, he's about to go up to the house and bind the strong man. These people serve the strong man. So, <clears throat> the devil knew what was happening. So Jesus is setting the record straight for any of us watching this event, all of us who will try to discern from it for the rest of history. That he said right here is happening God has called someone greater than Solomon, greater than uh, Jonah, the prophet, great prophet. And the chapter before he said there's one greater here uh, than the other prophets. But Jesus was never there alone. He was saying the love and compassion and plan of God our Father has so engulfed this nation right now because of the preaching of John the Spirit of God was there to confirm the words that this was the new thing. That God was going to fulfill his long-awaited promises to give us a new them, a new covenant. A beautiful opportunity to know God in a deeper way than simply by performing the tasks that the law required for their religious uh, justification. Boy, that's it exactly. And he said, this is going to be a relationship and I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people. Not just when you're in sorrow bringing up a sacrifice to the Holy Mount. You're going to be my people all the time and you're going to make decisions that won't even allow you to make the mistake that needs you to bring the sacrifice. You're going to do better because I'm going to be your God and I'm going to be with you and eventually Jesus is going to reveal he'll be in us. And that ability is the Spirit of God he's revealing here in verse 28. If this, this is happening by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is right here unto you. Just that Jesus was the minister. He was the one able to access it, say, and to minister it in such a way that people had no choice but to say something's happening. And right here Jesus is warning all the people present that, listen, what is happening is from God. Because Jesus spoke for himself and for his father. When they said Beelzebub, he said no. Listen to this once and know this for sure. This is what it looks like when you have prayed to God and hope he hears you. And you agree with David that he's inclined his ear to hear us. And now he's moving toward us to be the answer to our prayers. Emmanuel, God with us. And Jesus said this is what it looks like. This is the Spirit of God ministering. He happened to be the minister, but he was actually training other people to become the same. The important thing was it was God himself by his Spirit that was present. And Jesus was warning everyone, be careful when you are attempting to discern such happenings and don't speak carelessly or dismiss it carelessly. If you don't want to partake in it, simply go away. But don't think it's a calling from God to stand against this very move of God. Jesus meant when he said, he said, if you're not part of this movement to gather with this truth, what John the Baptist started, what Jesus was ministering, this truth that the kingdom of heaven is now open and available to all who can believe it and call upon God themselves and receive personal redemption and then relationship for themselves. What a beautiful gospel. What a beautiful covenant. And that's what John came offering. It's coming. And the person who is the covenant keeper is the one who's bringing it. And sure enough, before John would pass out of this life, Jesus would appear and be that very one. And now he's instructing this moment to make us all very aware. The Spirit of God is moving for our good. He's available in our world for our redemption and when we see that happening uh, if we're not part of the gathering with it we are actually being used to scatter it to help the enemy disperse it 
And Jesus warned these people. You might be on the sidelines whispering, hey, this crazy guy, he's doing this by Beelzebub. It has an effect, an ill effect. It affects the person next to them and the person next to them. And pretty soon this great, glorious appearing of God to be with us and answer our most needful needs is now confused to the people it's meant for because some false teacher is speaking anything their little mind conceives that they can blurt out to distract from us giving God his proper glory. And Jesus will set this record straight by warning us. So I'm going to read a little more. Verse 31, so he says, please beware. All manner of sin and blasphemy, whatever you say against me or even God previously, that's forgivable. It's forgivable. But to blaspheme against the presence of God, doing something that no one else has ever done, and with the minister giving complete glory to God above, not even to himself. No reason to suspect there's any selfish a uh, wheel going on in here. This is simply God showing himself that, yes, I am the God. I've always told you I am. I am the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of eternity, the God of Noah, the God of all the forefathers. He's God. And he's appearing to be the very good God that we want him and hope that he is. And when he was there delivering people, a mighty delivering God, there were people on the sidelines who rather than seek to be part of it and give glory to God and be caught up in it were simply, I don't know, say satisfied, but they were being used of the enemy to speak, and he will address this, to speak careless words that Jesus is warning. You will one day be judged by your own words. So if you don't understand the movement of God, leave it alone. But if you're curious and you sense that this is good, Jesus and we and the Spirit of God are always saying, come into it. Do not be on the outside. Just come into it and participate. God is so able to take us in and raise us up. We're not going to exhaust him or cause him to run out of grace or truth. He wants us. He makes a place for us. So rather than stay on the outside, because it's very easy to caught up be caught up in scorning. Jesus was warning these people, be careful who you influence. I'm here working. You're here working. What are, who are we working for? If you're not gathering with me, Jesus is saying, you're participating in the enemy's plan to disperse, to distract. Or he'll teach us in the parables coming that to catch away that which was sown in our heart. This glorious moment of watching somebody be healed from dumbness, deafness, possessed by a devil and they're going to walk away and give glory to Satan and Jesus said no you won't because now I'm warning you you're blaspheming you're calling what is good evil and you may do that against Jesus because he was a man like us and he understood our own nature and our ability to do that sadly as it is he said and people have and you blaspheme my father as God and the God of the temple and all that and yes you found fault with it and there is fault and people have blasphemed God in the process. But he's saying right now, with, there's no condemnation here. There's nothing you can find fault with. And God is working a perfect work. And be careful who we give the glory to. i got to go on. Verse 32. For whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whosoever speaks against this holy presence of God, this Holy Ghost, he's trying to teach us about it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world nor in the world to come. And there's a lot of warnings from so many ministers about how deep you'd have to know God to actually let this happen. Jesus is not giving us any careless warning. This is not people because we just forget God one day. We're, we're blaspheming against the Spirit. No, this is a deep, deep uh, experience. These people are supposed to know God. They spoke for God. They had authority in God's name. They were given position. And they affected people's lives. And for them to take that position and all their drama and try to turn this moment into something from Satan, Jesus said, it'll be remembered, even in the judgment. This will not go away quickly. Because if you don't can't acknowledge the presence of God showing forth the Son to be who He is, you'll never find salvation. All of us didn't meet Jesus because He came down our street. It's some presence of God working in our lives that have caused us 
to want something from God or to be a, afraid to enter into eternity without God or whatever has caused us to come to this faith. It's the Spirit of God. It wasn't Jesus in person. It certainly wasn't God the Father coming down off the throne to, to talk to us himself. That's how God moves. And Jesus is opening this up to us. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form, void. But the Spirit of God was there, moving upon the face of the waters. And then, the Word of God came. So the Spirit of God was already there, moving, preparing. And then God spoke. And there was the Word of God. And then there was light. And so on. And right here, Jesus is shedding light on this moment to help us see. If you don't understand the things of the Spirit of God, be still and learn. Don't be quick to be caught up in condemnation of things that we don't understand. That's all. But he said it's serious. So in verses 33 and 34, he says, Get back to making the tree good. That way everything that comes out of us will be good. Be watchful what we say around and to other people. Understand where this comes from. 34, O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? So he's challenging them and saying, my gosh, you're all dressed here. You've got all these people's attention. You're the religious elite. And you're using this opportunity to speak things that are not helping people. What's really happening here? Verse 35, a good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth evil things. He's trying to help them see, look, what's coming out of you is evil because it's coming from way down in there somewhere. And the work of us is to realize that and do something about it. Not be satisfied by just saying, because really these people were just led by the same uncleanness. I mean, they're just saying, they're not speaking for God, that's for sure. So Jesus really is saying, uh, <clears throat> giving them the opportunity to see themselves so that they also may change. When in verse 33, going back, when he says, either make the tree good or the fruit good, his hope is still that any one of us will see this, those people will see it, and desire that God would fix them and admit there's something going on in here that's not right so it can be fixed. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came to expose with his light what's wrong, what's going on in here, so we, with him, can work on it, to realize this is the presence of the Spirit of God, and be part of it, take hold of it, and let him fix us. Verse 36, But I say that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And that's a warning to me and everyone. That's why some days I'd rather just read what Jesus said. But I attempt, I dare, I'm willing to open my own mouth and give my own testimony about it. And I hope that's enough. Verse 36 to continue. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Verse 37, for by thy words. He's not saying by my words yet, my teaching or anything, or by God's commandments yet. But by your own words, you'll be justified. Or by your own words, you'll be condemned. So by them actually doing this and trying to frame this glorious appearing of God in their midst with his own son and representative of his kingdom and they trying to call it evil in darkness their own words we want to move on I hope that's just a look into the moment because this continues let's go verse 38 certain of them scribes and Pharisees answered saying master we would see a sign from these. So he's trying to get them to realize this is the Spirit of God. And now they're kind of getting it. And they say, well then, show us a sign. I mean, obviously, everything that already just happened was the sign. He cast out the devil so that this man could be free and go on and live a productive life. That's the sign of the presence of the kingdom of heaven. But they wanted more, and Jesus gave an answer for them. Verse 39, But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. Because what would it do? Would it change their heart then? Do they need one more sign? Hmm. Jesus said, you'll get one more sign. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. 
And uh, I give a quick comment. Yeah, quick comment. I was not raised in Sunday school. I didn't go to church as a child. The simple stories that I, I've become aware that churches used to teach to young people who wanted to learn it were stories about the creation and Noah's Ark and Jonah being swallowed by a great whale. And I've heard and now I've got to teach Sunday school and I realize, wow, these are awesome stories to tell young at heart people. But Jesus was talking to these very serious adults and religious elite and he was uh, taken from their, their storage of knowledge of the things of God. We again should take in the simple stories we've exposed our children to or we grew up with and realize there is so much more to it. I tell anyone, if you haven't read the Bible in a long time, you think you've read it before, go to Psalm 23. Everybody thinks they know something about Psalm 23. Read it afresh. Take time and meditate and realize this will speak new things to us today and our day. We are growing. The world uh, changes and grows. And the truths of God are constant. But they can ex speak to our deeper understanding as we get older and hopefully wiser and more knowledgeable at least. So to refresh ourselves, the story of Jonas, Jesus is bringing up here to remind them, wow, there's a sign. Talk about that sign. He was swallowed for three days and three nights and the whale's belly spit out on the land when he had got his heart right with God and prayed. And he was alive. And he went back and preached and the place repented. It's a long, good story. And Jesus said, wow, if that had happened in this day, people would be uh, ignoring that they repented in those days. But Jesus said, a greater than Jonas is right here in front of you referring to himself. And he said, and you're not repenting. You're not even being turned. No more signs would help you. What he did was expose why they were so hard and why they were so quick to speak things that were actually blasphemous because they were not in God's spirit. Why? He has summed it up in two words. Their whole generation was evil. It means it sought to follow the things that God has exposed that he's not pleased with and yet they continue to participate. And yes, adulterous generation. And even though you can get deep and think this is spiritual adultery, and most certainly it was because the Roman Empire, after the Greek Empire, and after all the other influences on the Holy Land of Israel, had brought in so much other cultures that they were supposed to deny, but they weren't succeeding, and it was sifting and getting its way in there. But natural, physical, adulterous, generation. This generation, Jesus addressed it over and over again. Having lived in such a generation myself, I can understand this. <clears throat> to not abide in God's covenants, especially of marriage, is how step by step churches, the world around us, has slipped and slid off the standard of God. John the Baptist gave his head because he addressed this particular disobedience. And Jesus is not letting them get away by saying, another sign will just cause you a momentary excitement until you go right back to your own bad behaviors and you will lose. The wicked one will catch away that which was sown in your heart and it will do you no good. Just wait till the sign he's going to give you. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I want to go on. Verse 41 he says, So the men of Nineveh repented. And they'll rise up in this generation and condemn this generation because a greater than Jonas, everything that happened to Jonas, a greater thing is happening right here. And Jesus is always trying to help us understand not just him, his person, but everywhere he went and everything he did was because the Spirit of God was there. A much greater thing was happening than just a person that they could one day snuff out, they thought, or hang on a cross and bury him. The Spirit of God cannot be killed and the Spirit of God is, was present the day before it happened, while it was happening, even though we talked Sunday about the, the Roman centurion. The Spirit of God was so present that even though some people would deny it, he would blurt it out, this must be the Son of God. The Spirit of God was there. Verse 42, the Queen of the South shall rise up in the generation with this, I'm sorry, in the judgment with this generation 
and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, the greater than Solomon is here. Again, if you know the Old Testament, if you have a experience with the knowledge of God from church or, or personally, these things will connect. If not, they're not going to say anything much to us, except if you would learn Solomon was a great and wise king. He was given credit for having gotten right out of God's heart the deep things of wisdom and knowledge. And God rejoiced over him when he asked for such things. And God gave him so many other things as well. And Jesus dares to say, right then and there, a greater than Solomon, right here. Not me, I cringe. But the Lord Jesus stood and said, look, everything you credit Solomon for, and that's wonderful because that was the spirit of truth, but now in this day, a greater than him is standing right before you. If you would take even the heed these people took to Solomon, the queen of the south came from far, far away just to get in his presence, sit in his palace and hear him speak his wisdom. And she was fulfilled. She said it was worth it. And Jesus is saying, wow, if those people could be here now, they'd look at you people and condemn you because you got something better than that going on here and you're too busy with your own evil and adulterous behaviors. And how's that going to allow us time? The most important, one of the most important things in this chapter is the rest of this part of the teaching where he says, the unclean spirit is going out of a man, he walketh through dry places and so on. Uh, I don't know how deep we're going to get into this now, but we need to talk about it, and so it probably will take into next Thursday, and we could wind up this chapter. But I want to make a couple of comments, because this is the day we're in, and who knows if I'll even have till next Thursday. So please, I live in a generation so exposed to so many crazy, crazy programs trying to help people get comfort by going around their property or their house or, or whatever it is and finding some kind of reason to believe it's possessed as if the roof, as if the Satan gave a darn about possessing your gutters or your windows. Because this parable has been so misunderstood and used to bring fear and then charge people uh, to solve their fears throughout history, Jesus did not walk into the temple of God the last time and declare the stones and the rocks evil. What he was going after was the strong man of the house, the enemy of our soul, who had somehow taken a seat, taken root, and was had servants and the wicked that, that Jesus would say that they planted, that the Satan planted. Working the works in the name of Jesus' Father, yet to do evil. The house, the temple itself, its structure wasn't evil or good. It was just a framework where behaviors take place, where things are spoken, relationships happen. Our own houses are the same. These teachings are not about my house. And all those crazy programs, sprinkling water and hearing voices and all this crazy stuff people are doing, Crazy people with religious vestments on, promoting these crazy things. I'm saying to anyone who's listening, this is what Jesus said. Are you ready? Thank you, Lord Jesus. When the unclean spirit, and he is, and I started to say, by the way, in my early days, I was atheistic. I didn't believe there was any God. And when it was such a great, wonderful revelation to come to the knowledge that there's God. And because there's God, I don't have to be afraid of him. He wants me. And he provide enough grace that through his son, I can know him. Not only do I know there is a God, but I can know him and believe he wants to know me and somehow does. All that wonder and, and that beauty moved me. 
And then gradually I had to face the fact that the same book that exposes God also exposes his enemy. And I was so slow to believe, oh, come on now, I believe it's God, that's enough, but you're not going to convince me there's a devil. I, I could not fathom. And I'm still allowing God to help me grasp some of this. But it's obvious that Jesus was in the battle between good and evil, between the spirit of darkness and God's spirit whom Jesus was filled with and was used by to minister God's heart to those he would love first, which is all of us first. He always moves toward us to love us first. If we want to deny that and keep denying that, I don't want to get into it, but that's what happens. So Jesus is telling how this happens. An unclean spirit, most of us grow up, we're not Christians when we're born. We're, actually, we're not. And so we learn to obey unclean things, uh, and we may do things disobedient. We do things, we like them, whether they're God's will or not, and sometimes they become habits. Jesus went around casting out unclean spirits and gave his disciples power to do the same thing. The behaviors in us that work in us things that will cause our destruction. God doesn't want for us, and he expects us to make decisions that do not follow after such things. And he'll give us the knowledge and the promises and even the, the, uh, the vision of a judgment coming to help us discern how important it is to make the right decision continually. But he's a great deliverer and he will never leave us in our errors if we have chosen not to go that way and follow after our own behaviors, our own hearts, minds. It's uncleanness and he will come into our life, cast that out and we'll be able to walk new. This is the born-again experience. This is what happened when John the Baptist was preaching and people received a baptism of repentance. They got up and they just not only felt, okay, they're forgiven of their errors, but they felt the unction from God that this is a new covenant. I'm going to be close enough to you that you're not going to want to sin. You're not going to want to go back and do the same thing you just asked me to forgive. I'm going to give you authority and power to walk new and different. Everything will become new. Everything about the decisions you make and why you make them and where you pull from to help you make them will all be new. You will now choose to draw from heaven and the fact that my soul will be alive forever and I want now to participate in making that a good thing. Not something to be afraid of, shy away from, or try to deny. I want, I'm given a chance to cooperate with the plan. Jesus said, it's the person. It's not a house. That's some of the most, I mean, God loves us. My house, I don't think he cares even as much as I do. This is the house he loves. And, and even the body, I'll drop it off. But I mean, this chance for him to have an experience in this life while I'm breathing in 2020. He wants to participate in this vessel. And when we give our life to Christ, he forgives us everything. There is nothing left that he is still grappling with or hoping will uh, get clean from. He offers us complete and absolute acceptance as we are. And we walk new and we walk free. And we have a pause, an opportunity to consider before we go forward to make the same mistakes. God wants to move in and help us learn we're his. And while we pray the prayer that says, Lord, lead me not into temptation. I'm still me. But you can make my day different. And you can get me to the other side of this day and I can realize I'm a winner now. I'm meant to overcome the temptation. Not to claim continually God's forgiveness. It's there. He told Peter, look, you better start getting ready to forgive somebody 490 times a day. You're not going to use it up. But it's so much to myself. It's so much more glorious to get up one day and talk to God and say, Thank you that I did not fall into that same destructive behavior yesterday. And once victory is tasted, it's glorious. And Jesus wants us to have the testimony that he is in my life or yours or ours for good. 
So he likens it to, here comes the unclean spirit that uh, mine, I had especially trouble with telling the truth. I, I thought nothing about lying. I was even had a job where I was commended for being a, uh, you know, better than most at, at deception. Twisting the truth. Compromising the truth. Lying. False witness is what God calls it. That was just one of the things. And you know, well, this speaks, this is my life right here. But when I first got saved, I did. I felt that cleanness. I felt, my gosh, the devil could come and look around. He the same thing. I was empty, swept. Everything was cleaned up, garnished even. You know, I was like uh, decorated for use. God wanted to show me off. But Jesus wants to the individual that he is working to redeem. And he'll give us a broader warning at the end. Good Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Please just, we'll wind this up in just a moment. But I want to leave you with this. The Spirit tries to come back. We're still in the world. Jesus doesn't take us out of the world. He takes the world out of us. But he leaves us here. And so the same enemies that used us before are still out there. And he says, they're going to come back. One's going to, the one that came out of me is going to come back and look around and say, wow, I can't get my job done anywhere else. It looks fine in here. Let me get back in here and work what I used to work. But, you know, I got the knowledge of God, the light of God. Now I got some experience with God. I want to preserve what I got. So this enemy has to go and get seven other spirits, Jesus said. I never kept an exact count. I don't understand these things so deeply. But I believe my Lord. And he said, that's what happens. If you want to continue to lie, to protect your lying, now you're going to have to do other things. And he brings other spirits. Spirits. What are we talking about? I'll jump ahead to give you a little clue of what's happening. I believe it's 15, Matthew 15. Here we go. They're stopping the disciples. They're eating with their hands. They're talking about what defiles a man. And here Jesus gives one of those little lists. The Bible has so many of these beautiful lists when God just says, Hey, look, you want to know what doesn't please me? This, this, that, and that, and this, and I mean it. No matter how you surround yourself by bending rules or laws or ordinances and you think you can surround yourself with company that will commend you for your real behaviors, God said, I already said, it's not acceptable. So you can do what you want with it, but in God's kingdom, it's not there. So where are you going to go with it? Here's one, Matthew 15. Uh, verse 18 to 20, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. There's a list of a few spirits and spiritual behaviors you don't want in your life. Uh, you want to hang on to thievery? You're going to learn to lie. You want to hang on to lying? You're probably going to protect yourself with some violence. Sooner or later, all the other things happen. Jesus said, if you don't sell out to God and you try to compromise with the enemy, he's not going to come back and take you right back where you were before. You're going to end up worse than you ever were. He goes on to say, though, what he's really trying to say. That's a great teaching, and we're going to talk about it again, I believe, next week. But what he's really doing is looking out at the generation with the religious leaders, the people listening to him, the people on the sidelines who have made up their mind, and all of us who have read this since, all of us, Jesus is saying, what I just described happens to the individual is going to happen to this whole generation. Even so shall it be unto this wicked generation. John the Baptist came and turned many to righteousness. It said he had multitudes following him, accepting his covenant, his understanding that God is doing a new thing and you're justified by faith. And so many of the generation felt that cleansing. And Jesus said, if you don't now follow John's teaching and accept me, Jesus, as your rabbi and continue to follow me, that enemy is still out there and those enemies will come back and this whole generation that John and Jesus himself worked so hard at trying to save will end up worse than it was in the beginning. Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit, those who do not understand what's happening, those who give themselves over to speak the things the enemy wants us to hear. Well, that could go on so deep, but I don't want to do it. I'm going to end with one thing. Please follow me. It's one thing to be disobedient. It's one thing to learn to lie a few times. It's one thing to have God save us and realize we've done that and be sorry for it and not try, strive not to do that anymore or fall into it. There are other people who will accept that. And it's not a mere simple disobedience anymore. I'm turning to the last 
chapter of the Holy Bible when things are done and we know what side things are on and what pleases God and here's what he said and I'm going to read a few verses and we're done because sometimes eventually when Jesus is calling these spirits he means this behavior this simple disobedience has now become a way of life everything we do from the morning we get up is centered around that disobedience fulfilling that emptiness that continual disobedience brings us and there's another list are you ready I'm going to read four verses, five verses from Revelation 22, verses 12 to 16. Please listen. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. Are you ready? Verse 15. For without this city, on the outside of this city, are dogs, spiritually, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. I wouldn't read that without a good ending. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. Do you realize at the end of all things when God finally can say, wow, it's done, there's going to be him and his people glorified in a place and on the outside of that place with all the people who are not, who haven't been, who are not included in this plan or this kingdom by their own choice. And now it won't be a simple disobedience. He, it won't be he was a liar. It is now he is carrying the personage. He has become, his title is he that loves and makes a lie. The guy who wants to kill everybody he disagrees with or is just so fervent against everything, killing is, is not uh, even, doesn't even phase him anymore. It won't be a simple mistake. It won't be a simple one-time disobedience. His title will be there with the murderers. His spirit, he will, he will become a person who is known by his disobedience murderer, adulterer, whoremonger. We won't even go there. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus to warn us, to bring light into our world so we can understand how important it is to seek after and to please you. Because there are other spirits at work in our world. Jesus said so, and so I'm believing it. I'm warned. Please help us be aware. That God's will is to be done. The end of chapter 12 identifies Jesus as saying, even more important than his own family relationships, the people that are important to him are those that want to do the will of the same God he's doing the will of. Let's let that be enough. Let's close with grace. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you made this day so that we can find you, so that you can bring us Jesus, so that we can be part of your kingdom. That's why you made this day. Not so we can find fault with everybody else or even ourselves and be left there. But let us, let me say in this prayer, there is grace available. God wants to forgive our disobediences. God wants to deliver us if we're bound by our disobediences and obeying them continually spiritually against the Spirit of God. And feel that. And God is a mighty deliverer. Jesus is the one who came into the furnace of fire and delivered the Hebrew boys because he's a mighty deliverer. Let us call on the name of Jesus Christ for help today. In his name I pray, and let your grace be sufficient. Amen. I know I went over. I thank you very much.